Great. Uh, thank you so much, Kimberly, uh, for arranging this and uh, really great uh, in terms of the CanCOVID uh, network and uh, uh, look forward to learning you know, from everyone uh, on the call as well. And uh, so we've been uh, interested in uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 in the heart because one of my interests for a long time is viral myocarditis. That is, uh, how does the virus interact with the immune system and have impact on the heart? And so this, uh, of course, uh, came uh, from uh, a long time uh, interest in the setting of uh, heart failure, particularly young people. And of course, when uh, this uh, uh, novel uh, coronavirus showed up, uh, it really was extremely intriguing. And uh, so um, if we actually look at the, what uh, happened, uh, and the most of you uh, obviously are way more familiar on this than I am, the first report back in Wuhan uh, back in December, and uh, one of my connections with Wuhan is just totally fortuitous in that one of my fellows uh, uh, for a long time ago is now the Dean of Medicine actually in uh, Wuhan University. And so uh, he actually alerted me to all this, uh, knowing my interest in this area uh, from very early days. But in fact, it now suggests that the, the um, virus probably was present even earlier. And it certainly was present in China, France, and elsewhere. Uh, but these really need to be confirmed. And, and uh, as of today, unfortunately, there are over 11 million cases worldwide and over half a million uh, patients have succumbed to the condition. And the World Health Organization is really you know, very, very concerned over the trend. Uh, fortunately, in Canada, we've been actually relatively successful, probably from the uh, good uh, science that's actually leading uh, the uh, overall policy as well as uh, collaboration amongst the citizens. So there are now about uh, hun over 100,000 cases in total in Canada with uh, 8,600 uh, deaths mostly in uh, long-term care homes. And uh, so today there are 399 new cases and about 3% uh, th positivity in terms of the testing. Uh, in the US, it's a completely different story and then there are over 3 million cases with 133,000 uh, deaths, uh, way 30 times more than in Canada. And uh, this is really uh, you know, testament of the differences, not just, not really related to virus, but in fact, the environment which the virus thrives, but also the uh, social, uh, economic, and uh, political conditions. And, uh, but the cases that we're counting likely represented because there are more asymptomatic cases that we uh, probably realize uh, at the present time. And this, of course, you know, led to many uh, interesting behavior uh, amongst all of us. And uh, so, uh, but it does represent unprecedented changes. I, I put this slide in because there is, uh, you know, a lot of controversy. Certainly over 200 scientists have actually written to the uh, WHO. And, uh, you know, there are some uh, concerns that, uh, you know, this uh, may not be just the primary droplet type of transmission, and then maybe aerosol. Uh, but I would say that the, you know, the reality is probably somewhere in between, and that it appears that uh, certainly people in close quarters for long periods of time, um, um, you know, like uh, in uh, restaurants or in uh, uh, choir settings, uh, one could actually acquire uh, the infection, even though uh, you, know, you are more than two meters apart, suggesting that there's uh, you know, uh, small particles that hangs uh, longer uh, in the air and uh, poses a risk and particularly ventilation is not so good. So, you know, this weekend, as we know, you know, young folks get together so excited because of opening up uh, does actually represent the perfect environment for uh, a lot of transmission because of these uh, properties. But uh, there's no question that this virus is relatively unique. It's different from SARS-CoV-1 is different from uh, the flu virus, and uh, it is particularly um, uh, concerning because of some of the uh, unique features, and some of them has a bearing on the cardiovascular system. So if we actually look at the, the, the um, timelines from infection uh, to uh, incubation to the symptoms and uh, ultimately outcomes, and uh, keep in mind there's a huge diversity in terms of outcome depending on the individual and the comorbidities, and that uh, the uh, major concern is uh, the um, section in blue circles in that uh, uh, there are uh, these uh, asymptomatic periods, uh, particularly before symptoms can uh, take place, the pre-symptomatic and also post-symptomatic period. And uh, that uh, can be 
uh, uh, particularly concerning because the, the uh, host is actually very infectious uh, potentially during this time and uh, thus uh, making it more difficult to uh, truly um, uh, identify you know, who is actually potentially infected. This is where uh, testing and contact tracing uh, obviously is uh, so critical. And uh, so the SARS-CoV-2 is uh, uh, perfectly equipped uh, to uh, create the global pandemic uh, because of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a number of features that is relatively unique. If you compare it to SARS-CoV-1, that uh, it has a more compact uh, uh, spike head. It does share uh, more than 70% homology, but uh, it is uh, relatively unique. And uh, it has a more uh, stable spike configuration. And there's been recent uh, uh, study uh, suggesting that the, the uh, mutation that taken place back in March uh, may, in fact, further enhances its uh, infectivity. And also, it has a unique furin uh, cleavage uh, uh, site that uh, facilitates the uh, uh, cell uh, entry uh, through uh, membrane uh, fusion and the injecting of the virus uh, genomic material. And uh, so it's important to also keep in mind that, that the receptor is the same as SARS-CoV-1 and it's ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is nature's antidote to angiotensin 2, which is a, uh, a vasoconstrictor, pro-inflammatory agent, which is bad. And uh, that's why we use ACE inhibitors, uh, you know, which is against ACE1 uh, to cut down this. So ACE2, uh, in fact, is nature's antidote because it breaks down angiotensin 2. But it works with uh, uh, other co-receptors. Uh, Tempress 2 is a, a typical pre protease, but there are other uh, co-receptors uh, more uh, emerging uh, all the time, and that may give us a further insight into this infectivity. And uh, I thought I'd just uh, cover uh, this uh, paper from Cell just a few days ago. It's a uh, uh, you know, certainly very interesting proposal uh, looking at the, um, this uh, particular mutation in the uh, spike protein and uh, the uh, D614G mutation, uh, because it certainly appears that uh, since December, the dominant form uh, is the D um, uh, amino acid that uh, uh, is dominant in Wuhan and in Asia uh, until it got to Europe and uh, somewhere. Um, in uh, possibly um, uh, late uh, February, early March, uh, the mutation appeared particularly in uh, Italy and France and it is now the dominant uh, 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 genetic sequence for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, some modeling by the investigators suggests that uh, now uh, it certainly has taken over as the dominant form and certainly in the US uh, now is uh, uh, the uh, uh, genetic sequence and uh, through some in vitro work, uh, it does actually suggest that this mutation has enhanced very significantly the interaction with the ACE2 receptor and uh, uh, very significantly also increases its ability to infect the target cells. <clears throat> and uh, the, with, with the knowledge of ACE2, uh, one can actually uh, predict uh, a potential tropism of the virus uh, in the various tissues and uh, also correlate with the symptoms. And uh, just a, a few examples there, uh, certainly it does uh, target the, the lymphocytes and the dendritic cells of the immune system. And uh, so it can actually affect the, the immune system in addition to fever, et cetera, which are dominant, but also lymphopenia, which is a very important prognostic factor. And also the um, ACE2 uh, and the Tempress2 are present at very high levels in the type two lymphocytes in the lung, and uh, and uh, the uh, and also uh, particularly in the oropharynx and nasopharynx as well, and uh, this likely uh, enhances its infectivity, which is uh, you know uh, much more efficient than say uh, the original SARS, and uh, this uh, uh, upper um, uh, respiratory tract infection uh, very rapidly can actually go to a lower respiratory tract and leading to the um, uh, much more serious disease in the patient. It can also, because of ACE2 localization uh, in the uh, cardiovascular system, in the heart, in the vasculature, and also in the neurons as well, uh, that we can actually see there's a release of cardiac enzymes and there's a potential presence of myocarditis, arrhythmias, 
which of course is a major problem when you have patients potentially taking things like hydroxychloroquine, which hopefully is not uh, anymore. But nevertheless, you know, that was a major concern. And then also the vascular and, and the system and coagulation system, which is a major factor in terms of complications for these patients. I thought just to mention that, uh, you know, there's uh, interesting data to suggest that in the spike protein uh, configuration, there's uh, the binding site for the ACE2, but there's also an RGD binding site as well. And uh, so uh, uh, other co-receptors such as integrins uh, may actually also uh, participate in this and may help to uh, indicate its localization. And I put the, down some of the candidates here. Certainly, Tempest 2 is the most dominant uh, co-receptor and is critical uh, for facilitating membrane fusion and uh, then transfer of genetic material uh, together with ACE2. Uh, but uh, the uh, integrins, particularly, for example, uh, integrin alpha-5, which is part of the fibronectin molecule, the important matrix uh, 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 composition in the vascular system and uh, in the um, uh, in, uh, in cardiovascular uh, uh, organs uh, in general, uh, really may also uh, show its predilection, for example, for the vascular um, um, infection and leading to some of the complications. And so the major risk profiles for COVID patients, the reason that the cardiovascular system uh, seemed to be involved qu even quite early from the epidemiology, and that is that patients with a history of cardiovascular disease or uh, risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, particularly have a high death rate. And uh, <clears throat> in addition to lung disease and cancer, for example. And this, of course, has been magnified in the U.S. Uh, because of socioeconomic uh, uh, disparities, uh, especially in the Black population, Latino population. And that's why the death rate in those populations are so dramatically elevated. And uh, we see, uh, you know, really how uh, COVID-19 uh, really has magnified the, uh, you know, disparities in our society. Now, in terms of the uh, temporal trend of uh, uh, infection, but uh, together also with the cardiac involvement, uh, map out to the uh, viral uh, shedding, the, uh, uh, the timelines of, of the infection, but also in terms of release of uh, cardiac markers of injury, which is troponin, uh, which is a member of the contractile element in the mouse site, but can be actually released and measured as a biomarker. And you can see that, in fact, it can be released quite early. And uh, this just means that uh, there is an injury in the myocardium, but it's not necessary in that the cell has died, like in, uh, in myocardial infarction. But nevertheless, if the troponin continue to increase, similar stress markers like nt BMP continue to increase, the patient is much likely uh, going to have actually very significant vasculitis together with coagulation abnormalities, increased clotting. And uh, this also sets the stage for the cytokine storm and the suggesting that uh, these uh, components uh, in terms of systemic response tend to converge together to really lead to the adverse outcomes, the mortality, the uh, requirement of, of a prolonged ventilation uh, in these patients. I thought I'll just uh, um, come back a little bit on the receptor and uh, its particular role in cardiovascular system and the controversy that actually has uh, caused as a result. So we see that uh, ACE2 uh, is uh, in fact uh, both an enzyme and also happens to be receptor. It's a uh, um, uh, it's um, a catalytic domain is uh, expressed on the cell surface. And this is the part that converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7 as a counter-regulator of uh, angiotensin 2. But in the setting of uh, heart disease, such as heart failure or patient with hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, uh, it turns out that there is increased expression of ACE2. Uh, diffusely in the vascular system, probably elsewhere as well, we think fat cells may have it, uh, the inflammatory cells may have it. And so this partly also uh, 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 compatible with the observation that these patients are particularly uh, somewhat prone to this. But once the uh, virus engages the receptor, the receptor actually gets internalized. And the function may be actually diminished. We don't have definitive proof of this. Uh, we have done work 
more uh, with SARS-1 to show that this does happen. Uh, we have not uh, you know, confirmed uh, in um, absolute certainty that this happens, but uh, certainly the uh, biomarkers tend to suggest what happens that uh, when you have internalization of ACE2, you disable this uh, very important salutary enzyme uh, for the renin angiotensin system, you get then reduction in terms of the angiotensin 1-7, which is the good angiotensin, and then increase in the angiotensin 2, which is the bad angiotensin, which then increase vasoconstriction, increase inflammation, increase free radical production, and all the uh, adverse consequences from that. So, so apologies here, uh, sorry, next slide, yeah. So, um, so certainly uh, the thinking is that the, the fact that ACE2 is related to renin angiotensin system, which is a, a very active in cardiovascular disease, is probably one of the linkages of this virus with the um, uh, cardiovascular system. Uh, but uh, the controversy arose in that there has been some observation, but these are small studies, some are preclinical, suggests that if you actually use ACE inhibitors, which is what you usually would use you know, for patients at risk for increased angiotensin, it may actually increase ACE2 levels as a kind of a counter-regulation, and therefore may predispose patients to more COVID-19. And so some patients and physicians were quite worried and actually want to stop ACE inhibitor ARB. And so some of the patients end up with severe hypertension, uh, heart failure, and it really is uh, really, you know, I think uh, adding uh, a confusion uh, to uh, something that probably is uh, more theoretical. So we actually have looked at, and the many others as well, there are now um, more than 20 studies uh, looking retrospectively uh, what happens uh, in a cohort of patients with COVID-19. So this is a study that we looked at uh, in uh, over a thousand patients with COVID-19 and hypertension who then therefore would benefit from consideration of ACE inhibitors. And what we had found, keeping in mind this is retrospective, not prospective, randomized. And so from this retrospective look that the patients who are ACE inhibitors, ARB, indicated in the red color uh, in the uh, diagram there, the mortality was 3.7% at 28 days versus if the patient were not on ACE inhibitor ARB, the mortality is actually 9.8%. So definitely there's no risk associated with ACE or ARB. In fact, there could be benefit and uh, because of the fact that it actually reduces uh, uh, the angiotensin II effect. And then in fact, there are now about 20 studies and majority of them uh, show that it's safe or in fact could be uh, beneficial. So definitely not at risk. And so the current guidelines suggest that patients should continue on these medications if they are on it. If they are not on it, then they can potentially participate in randomized trial. There are several randomized trials going on and we have uh, been actually uh, doing one and we were very fortunate to get the CIHR funding for this. Uh, so, so this happened to be the covid rasi trial uh, in which we, um, recruit patients over age 65 with cardiovascular risk factors, and then randomize them to either continuing or starting ACE or ARB versus stopping it, and uh, then look at endpoints of 28 days of death or ventilation, ICU, et cetera. And uh, so we generally look at patients in hospital, but we also recruit from long-term care homes or old age homes, uh, because that's actually the largest population who uh, this uh, type of treatment is particularly relevant. If it is positive, of course, then it would add to our armamentarium of treating patients uh, who uh, may be particularly at risk of uh, complications or death. And uh, the um, last component I want to add in terms of the mechanism here is uh, on the um, uh, uh, inflammatory side. So as I mentioned earlier, the release of uh, uh, cardiac markers like troponin or BMP showing that the heart is under stress or there's mild, uh, mild damage uh, probably reflect the fact that there is actually a very uh, exuberant inflammatory response. And uh, the uh, characteristics of the inflammatory response from what we have seen so far is that if the patient has lymphopenia and if the patient has the dominant macrophage response, uh, they are particularly at risk of uh, having uh, elevation of IL-6 over time, which then 
uh, predicts the development cytokine storm and uh, then multi-organ failure. And uh, so, um, so it appears that uh, the virus uh, actually shifts uh, the uh, innate and acquired immune system response uh, with favoring the innate immune system. And particularly the CD4 population uh, tend to be suppressed somewhat. Whether this is a direct virus effect or indirect effect is not clear. And uh, uh, there are probably other you know, experts on the call who would actually have much better insight in this. And, uh, but uh, this is of concern uh, because of the fact that we do know that uh, this is a uh, CD4 population is very important, not only in terms of attenuating the virus itself, and uh, also in terms of production of type 1 interferon, which is uh, critical for um, uh, innate uh, immune response to uh, foreign um, uh, pathogens, uh, but uh, uh, it really is a uh, uh, critical uh, the type 1 interferon uh, of attenuating the virus and the low levels of interferon appears to correlate with worse outcomes. But the other thing which I think is also concerning is that this will have potential impact also on the memory cells, which are responsible ultimately uh, in terms of developing immunity. And uh, we're already getting hints that uh, the you know, immune response to uh, COVID-19 is not as intact as we would like. And of course, this is a uh, one of the biggest questions that I know the Can COVID Network is going to be addressing, and this is uh, obviously super critical for all of us going forward. Now, looking at the COVID-19 and the heart, uh, it suggests that uh, there can be actually punctate uh, patchy necrosis, uh, but there is absence of uh, or very little lymphocyte, which is a big factor in this type of setting. And uh, so this is very atypical, maybe related to lymphocyte uh, suppression. Um, so maybe I'll skip these, but uh, I will uh, mention another complications as a result of inflammation together with vasculitis, and that's developing blood clots, you know, thrombosis. And uh, in terms of uh, microvascular thrombosis, so there's a thinking that, uh, in fact, in the lung, uh, there's patchy uh, blockade of uh, uh, small vessels in the lung, but there can be also large blood clots as well. Patient can develop pulmonary embolism, peripheral deep vein thrombosis, and there's a high propensity uh, in terms of uh, uh, increased thrombosis. So there is a, a certainly a movement to uh, anticoagulate the patient fully uh, for these settings. I will just highlight a couple of the therapies uh, which uh, you know, most folks already know. Of course, one very exciting, um, data coming from the recovery trial of uh, Oxford, uh, even though we don't have the full uh, paper yet, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, just this is data from a press release uh, that suggests that the patients, particularly um, who are at high risk, who are on ventilators or requiring uh, oxygen uh, supplementation at the high levels may benefit from dexamethasone. And, uh, but this does not apply to patients with lower risk and in fact, they may increase mortality. And so this is a very fine line uh, that one needs to actually uh, personalize uh, in terms of which patient uh, should be considered for this treatment. And of course, there's a, a lot of excitement regarding remdesivir. Uh, currently, the data from the NIH trial mainly shows there's a reduction in the number of days in hospital. The mortality is uh, tantalizing. It's uh, in the right uh, direction. Uh, but it did not hit uh, the uh, statistical significance. And there are other studies going on at the uh, present time. But remdesivir certainly looks very, very promising as an antiviral, probably should be used earlier. And there are other uh, treatments that's also ongoing. Of course, you know, actually right now there are like uh, over 2,000 trials uh, going on. And uh, another one that's uh, quite exciting is the uh, IL-6 uh, antibody uh, trying to uh, particularly target patients who are at risk of cytokine storm. And so in terms of the uh, strategies for treatment, especially from cardiac point of view, uh, I think risk factor modification makes a huge difference for these people by modifying their risk altogether. And uh, then for patients who's in the ICU, uh, uh, cons um, consideration of dexamethasone is important and uh, full anticoagulation uh, maybe uh, also important, but uh, there are ongoing trials for this. 
and also consideration of uh, ACE inhibitors uh, or also considering trial and uh, antiviral agents uh, as well. For the hypoxic patient, it's very important to uh, provide very high flow oxygen. Uh, some of these patients may not be as dysnic as uh, uh, originally presumed, uh, maybe uh, interference you know, with the respiratory center and things like that, and uh, then intubation for those patients uh, who are having difficulty in terms of uh, maintaining oxygenation. Um, I should uh, just wrap up by saying that, of course, one always look forward to the vaccine, and there are many vaccine candidates, including those that's uh, being developed in Canada and also being tested in Canada. And that there are new modalities of vaccine development as well, particularly these RNA vaccines, which is brand new. And so, you know, uh, there's certainly a lot of new things we can learn uh, out of this, and hopefully uh, some will succeed going forward. So I think that in terms of COVID-19, it is going to be here for the next while. And as long as there are uh, susceptible uh, individuals, this will be an issue and uh, that uh, we need to ultimately um, uh, practice uh, good public health measures until we have enough vaccination and enough immunity in the population. Thank you so much. Sorry, I uh, went over a little bit of time. No, no, that's great. It was um, fantastic information. I really appreciate you sharing. We did have a little bit of chatter in the in the chat, so if we just take a few minutes since we started a bit late. Um, Kelly had a question about the ACE2 inhibitors, and Kelly, please feel free to turn your microphone on and ask the question yourself if you've gotten it answered, because you spent a little bit more time about it. But her understanding was that ACE2 was missing from most immune cells? Uh, yeah, so um, I think depending on the population, there is some suggestion that the ACE2 is a uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, present, uh, you know, in uh, uh, suggesting dendritic cells and things like that. But it is true that uh, uh, ACE2 is not a dominant, uh, you know, uh, certainly in terms of uh, distribution, uh, you know, in the lung, this uh, GI system is, uh, you know, are the dominant tissues. Uh, but uh, uh, it is uh, uh, potentially uh, some things, ACE2 definitely have a very important uh, inflammatory modulatory effect. And uh, so it may not be all from the ACE2 receptor. Uh, but certainly uh, it is uh, a participant uh, in the uh, response. Thank you. Um, and Catherine adds that uh, receptor does not equal active replication. Has the virus replication actually been confirmed in all of these tissues? That you uh, no, this is why I was mentioning earlier, the co-receptor is uh, uh, you know, just as important. Uh, yes, I think ACE2 provides the, and uh, there could be other receptors as well, you know, but ACE2 certainly is the dominant one. And about just having the receptor alone, uh, is not uh, uh, sufficient. And I think, uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, Tempress 2 the, the original uh, paper that uh, uh, described, you know, the ACE2 and the Tempress 2 together shows that if you don't have Tempress 2 uh, that you don't actually have, uh, you know, uh, adequate viral infectivity. And uh, people are, are developing, for example, Tempress 2 inhibitors, you know, as part of a therapeutic uh, strategy. But the thing is that there are other co-receptors that may also help to determine, you know, tissue uh, tropism. Right, but if I may ask a follow-up, is that possible? Please go ahead. Um, yes. I'm just kind of trying to clarify because it seems to me that even if the virus has all the receptors it needs, it, it's very much a different barrier to clear to actually have active replication. So I was wondering, because you were comparing symptoms um, that occur in, in COVID to tissue that have ACE2. And so I was wondering whether in any of these particular sets of tissues, they were ever able to confirm active virus replication, like actual shedding. Uh, yeah, so the best the data in the lung, you know, people actually have done pathology studies now. And uh, so, uh, you know, you can actually directly see the virus in the uh, type two pneumocytes. And, uh, you know, so th that, that's a very uh, 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 well confirmed, uh, but you can see them in the macrophages, you know, so somehow the virus gets into the macrophage. And uh, also the endothelial cells, uh, not as much, uh, but the GI system. And we know that uh, the nasopharynx, uh, you know, of course, that's where the test is done. And, uh, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the GI system, you know, the, the, the children who may be totally asymptomatic, they can actually shed the virus for, for uh, you know, uh, a month or two. And, uh, and that's totally just in the GI system and nowhere else. And again, in pathology, people have found, even in the liver, uh, they can actually identify the virus. 
And uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, uh, but uh, certainly ACE2, where it is, seem to kind of, uh, you know, point to where the virus might be. Great. Uh, but we'll just end with one last one, which is, can you comment on observations of longer term health problems of recovered patients? Yes. Yes. Uh, so this is originally everybody just thought, oh my God, you know, so this is a, a devastating disease in the ICU, you know, and uh, that uh, patients uh, who are asymptomatic is going to be blessed. And, uh, uh, you know, so that's kind of the original thinking until people now begin to have a longer uh, term follow up. And so for sure, the, uh, there are patients who are totally asymptomatic and you actually do long uh, CT scans or MR scans, uh, you will find that there are scars. You know, so this is, uh, it just shows you, you know, just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean you didn't have the disease. And so, you know, so this is going to be something we need to follow. Similarly, patients with heart, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, involvement with the elevated uh, cardiac enzymes, uh, when you do the echocardiogram a month to two months down the road, there are subtle heart abnormalities as well. And uh, similarly, you know, people, for example, lose uh, the smell and the taste. You know, so a large number of those do recover, but some patients, you know, have these as a permanent uh, loss. And so definitely this virus has a huge diversity in terms of uh, effect on people and also in terms of long-term follow-up. And yeah, we're just you, learning all the time. And so don't assume that there's no... Uh, you know, think, no do research. you have any um, follow-up or treatment protocols developed as of yet? I mean, it's so new still. Yeah, so it's a very new. So we are having a, a, a kind of a, a COVID follow-up a clinic uh, at the present time. Our infectious disease organizing that. And uh, so patients, particularly ones with more severe disease, are you know being followed up. Just to make sure that there are no uh, major uh, residual you know, from the infection. Well, thank you so much. I won't take any of your time. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. We'll be back again um, next week, same time, 4 p.m. on Tuesday, Eastern time. Um, and next week, we'll be talking about food insecurity and COVID. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Peter Liu. Great. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, you take care.